Recognized as top 50 influential AI leaders in India and top 40 under 40 data scientists, Dr. Anish is a professional with over 20 years of experience and expertise in delivering value through data across a spectrum of industry verticals. An informed opinion leader in the fields of data analytics, cybersecurity, strategy design, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Dr. Anish is a trusted expert who has moved and inspired people and organizations with innovative ideas, scaling them into sustainable change, not just in one company or industry, but globally. Dr. Anish has authored more than 15 articles on various subjects related to artificial intelligence and advanced data analytics, and delivered keynote sessions in more than 90 national and international conferences. Some of his most well-known work as an AI leader include the interlock between artificial intelligence and quantum computing, application of artificial intelligence in wireless communication, boosting memory-based collaborative filtering using content metadata, and artificial intelligence and ethics. Along with his technical contributions to the field, he is also a leading voice advocating for ethics and diversity in AI and STEM, and has received numerous awards and recognitions for his work. He also spends time mentoring aspiring data scientists and has been recognized as top five data science mentors in India. He is on the panel of a number of AI-themed industry bodies and a member of the advisory board of universities intending to set up structured courses on data science and artificial intelligence. He is an alumnus of Harvard Business School and MIT, MIT Sloan Business School, and is also a visiting guest faculty in several colleges and universities in India. Welcome, Dr. Anish. Thank you very much, Sruti, for that warm introduction. Um, perhaps you've taken a lot of uh, time in um, providing a quick background about myself. Um, it wasn't really needed, uh, just the name was fine. But thank you very much. I will not <laughs> spend more time talking about myself. Rather, let's jump on to the session. Um, and today's session is on artificial intelligence. Uh, one of our favorite topics, and perhaps uh, I'm sure everyone uh, would agree, that AI today is less of a buzzword, more of a fashion statement. Everyone is keen to understand what are the capabilities, what are the aspects and nuances around artificial intelligence, because it is AI which actually would lead to a drastic change and perhaps has been bringing a significant change in the way we not just interact with the computers, but also the manner in which we can understand various subjects and uh, gain expertise and solve problems and resolve them in a much more quicker manner. So in today's session, uh, I'll not just provide a quick overview around artificial intelligence, but we'll also delve on to the science behind or the logics uh, behind. And I'll also make an effort to clear or clarify some of the myths related to artificial intelligence. And to start with, I want to first talk about why are we talking about AI now? Why didn't we talk about AI 30 years ago? And all of us know that AI is not a new uh, concept. Uh, AI came into um, existence almost 50 to 60 years ago when Sir Alan Turing, during the World War II, designed the first machine which actually was able to decrypt uh, certain messages using a certain set of algorithms. So what actually took us uh, so much time to actually really realize the potential and power of artificial intelligence? It is primarily because the, because the trajectory of technological process or the progress. And if, and, because, and if you were to look at the trajectory, as, and as you can see uh, the graph uh, on the screen, the way technology evolution happens is not linear. What that means is if we were or if we witness and certain advancements in technology in the last 10 years, there is no guarantee that the technology will also advance in a similar manner in the next 10 years. And 
as I as I say, in thinking about what the world would look like in 30 years, maybe 2047 or 49 or 50 from now, we cannot compare how the past 30 years uh, were. As an example, if we if we go back in time to the towards the start of the 20th century, that is when aviation as a, as an as a technology really you know pulled up. 1903 is when Wright brothers apparently invented the first aircraft. And if we talk about the aviation industry today, it is one of the safest mode of transport. And perhaps I'm, I'm sure you would agree, the phone that you currently are holding in your hand, the smartphone has evolved drastically in the last 10 years. Think about a phone in the last 10 years ago, we wouldn't have even imagined something like a smartphone. We wouldn't have imagined the power of a computer in the palm of our hands. We wouldn't have imagined that we would be actually negotiating or trying to buy a phone which has equal power, whether it's RAM or the storage, which is equivalent to a desktop computer, and other better than that. That's how technology has evolved. So, and one of the underlying aspects around artificial intelligence is big data. And I'm sure everyone would know what what are the uh, nuances around big data big data essentially is the passive data which actually has huge volume velocity that means the speed at which the data gets generated the variety of data gets that gets generated and the veracity which is the accuracy of data the reason veracity is important here is because given we are sourcing the data direct from the source which is captured by the systems the data is 100 percent authentic given it doesn't have any manual intervention. We'll talk about a few of these aspects as we progress with the remaining slides. And we all know data is a new oil. If, if we talk about the biggest companies in the world, uh, almost 10 years ago, majority of these companies would have been the oil and petroleum companies. But if we talk about the biggest companies today, they're all technological companies. To an extent, uh, there is a term called GAFA economy, GAFA stands for Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. And if you sum total the market cap of these four big tech giants, it is much bigger than the overall GDP of many, many countries. That actually means that if you look at the overall impact, what these enterprises, big tech giants have on the world economy, it is significant. To an extent, it, they have the potential to bring the next uh, revolution. Perhaps they've already brought the revolution. Social media is not just social media. Today, social media has the power and ability to actually not just rig elections, but also to make someone superstar overnight. And also, if used wisely, it is it brings significant economic returns to enterprises and companies. So, if we if we talk about so if we, if we were to replace um, these tech giants with uh, the oil companies. There's also an element of what are we uh, extracting? Just like the way a petroleum company would extract oil uh, from the sea, these tech giants are from basis of technology. What are we extracting? We are extracting several data points. Data points in relation to raw data, you know, block files, notes, customer information, emails, contracts, essentially a set of qualitative and quantitative data. And you know, artificial intelligence, as I said, is less um, of a sense, but more of a fashion buzzword to an, to an extent that companies today are using AI as, as a buzzword to sell their products. And it's, it's, it's notoriously hard to define what AI is. People and companies use it to mean things that are hard for computers to do, like understanding English as opposed to things that we already know. How do, how, and how do we do that with computers? So as an example, on the right-hand side, you'll see three products. So LG apparently has designed a TV, which is OLED TV. And they say it's, it's got artificial intelligence, which is an ability to actually you know, transition the image basis, the surroundings, and basis, the picture quality. I also came across a, 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 a manufacturer, a automobile manufacturer. It says, you know, it's got AI and reverse care. But I'm not sure if you really need an electric scooter with, with artificial intelligence and, and the capability of a reverse care. And, and the most interesting device that I could find on the internet, uh, which 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 has been sold uh, as uh, based on AI as a uh, capability, is uh, a juicer, which says it's it's a self feeding juicer where you don't need to feed in fruits. It, I'm not sure how would it work. So 
at times ai gets really confusing and that's where you know i think it's important for us to really understand what artificial intelligence is all about essentially if 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 i was to give you a very simplistic definition of ai ai is all about process which which has been done uh, by human beings if you complement that process with a set of data that's about it or in simpler words artificial intelligence is all about machines acting in a way that seems intelligent ai is not a technology people misconceive that this and they have a misunderstanding that ai is a technology but that's not the case ai is a technique similar to way agile is a technique similar to way six sigma is a technique six sigma is not a not a technology likewise ai is not a technology there is a difference between ai and machine learning artificial intelligence if we understand as the sum total of the overall universe artificial intelligence is all about ability to sense reason and engage and learn it includes computer vision natural language processing uh, robotics uh, and planning and optimization however machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and there are three dimensions of machine learning supervised learning unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning and there are different methods which are used to actually achieve the outcomes and goals of what we would intend to do basis machine learning as an example we can use uh, regression decision trees and this has been done basis various platforms either it could be uh, python as a tool or it could be a, a, an api or a sensor or an iot device which actually is used to capture the data and if i was to plot the ai in a simplified landscape and if on the x axis i deploy the level of sophistication versus the axis y which has mass adoption or application on the x axis right on the right uh, on the left we will see a narrow ai which is a basic role and you know uh, tasks which are being done versus to right towards the extreme end on the right which is about deep ai which actually means that specific ai uh, bot or an ai tool is continuously learning and is aware and here you can see a few of the examples which actually you can relate to some of the devices that you may be also using on a day-to-day -day basis personal assistants digital personal assistants as an example series and alexas of the world they are basically a combination of natural language processing speed processing and machine learning and it continuously learns as well and as we, as we progress towards the right hand side where the complexity and sophistication increases one of the favorites here is Watson, which is a speed, which is a machine learning based speech recognition system, which which processes both structured and unstructured data. And then there is an there's a there's a view of neural networks as well, how neural networks actually learn and predict. So essentially, if you were to design a neural network to design or identify, let's say, dog as an animal, what it simply does, it breaks down that image or your training data set into various aspects, be it the head, be it the eyes, be it the ears, be it the neck, or be it any part of the body. You, you actually feed in the similar images regularly or in a, rec, in, a, in a recurring basis. The algorithm learns what exactly is an outlier, what actually fits very well in the shape of a dog. And that's how it not just intuitively, but very accurately identifies an image could be what it is intended to train on. Let's look at some of the applications of artificial intelligence. And for this session, what I've done is I've aggregated a few fantastic videos, um, which actually very beautifully explains uh, the overall purpose and overall application of artificial intelligence. But before that, let's also understand the implications of AI in an overall you know, landscape. You name the sector today, we have an application for artificial intelligence be it education, uh, it's been used to check plagiarism, uh, it's been used to also check to automate the grading as an example with work from home or work from school, uh, work from or, or school, schooling from home, I'm sorry, uh, getting so rampant and common now, while we are now on, on, the, on the recovery course where schools are opening, but certain AI algorithms are also being used to automate the grading. Online shopping is another you know, common example where the search recommendations uh, the customer service and sales chatbots and you know, 3D modeling is being done of the products using AI. Healthcare, you know, or autonomous surgical robots, uh, drug discovery, personalized treatment, uh, health monitoring, wearable health trackers and stuff. And even in agriculture, social networks, you name the sector, 
you've got an application of AI, uh, which perhaps can be found. Let's have a look at the first video for today. This is a video of a company called Blue River Technology, where they're using artificial intelligence in the field of agriculture. Everything. We saw an opportunity to take plow ag machines to see every plant in a field. We thought that we could give farmers the ultimate flexible tool to treat their field and manage their field in whatever way they wanted by having the knowledge of every plant and its situation and an ability to spray very precisely, whether it be herbicide only to the weeds or fertilizer or fungicide directly on each plant that needed it. Each field they go to has a different set of conditions and they need to be able to adjust and correctly set that machine's performance for the field. One knob could be the the protection of the cotton plant and how big of a buffer, a safe zone that we provide the plant so that when you apply selective materials or non-selective materials that we have the appropriate buffer. Another dial is how aggressive do you want to be at going after anything that looks like a weed. There's also some opportunities to inform the grower of how many weeds the system seen, even what kinds of weeds exist in the field that they can start to tailor their herbicide programs towards those weeds. The cameras and computers on a scene spray machine are using deep learning algorithms that are similar to what's used in facial recognition. The first time we saw a pigweed, the machine didn't know what kind of plant it was, but we taught it by giving it tens of thousands of examples of that pigweed, and now it's an expert in pigweed. We save up to 90% of the amount of herbicide that you would spray if you were spraying the entire field. The weeds have become a little bit more of a pest than what they were originally. Uh, they become resistant to a lot of the herbicide that we've been using on them. With the rig, we have other options open to us. We can spray different chemicals that we were not able to spray before. We can take one man and put him on a tractor, and we can do the work of eight to 10 people. We're seeing no end to the use of this technology. Essentially, anything that may be cost prohibitive or more difficult to do when you're spraying on a broadcast basis, but much more grower beneficial if we're spraying on a very precise basis. I hope all of you got a gist of uh, what this technology was all about. So essentially what they've done using cameras and IoT and sensors, they've actually trained the machine learning um, you know, algorithm to identify a certain kind of weed. And given we need fertilizers to ensure that there's no extra, there's no weed in the overall uh, plantation because weed actually takes a lot of nutrients out of the soil. What uh, this tool does is this tool actually identifies a specific spot where it spots the weed and only sprinkles or sprays the fertilizer in that particular spot. Several benefits. One, there's no ex enhanced expenditure on um, fertilizers. And the second is there is an element in, of fertilizers because it's chemical-based composition. It, it also impacts the yield and the output is, of the crop as well and the crop quality as well. So in this case, the fertilizers are only impacting the uh, weed, but not impacting the actual crop. That actually means it's actually retaining the nutritional value of the crop that's been sowed in that field. What a brilliant use case. Let's have a look at another video. This is of Amazon Go, uh, a setup that Amazon launched in the US a few years ago. Uh, hopefully this should come to India sometime soon, but there may be reasons why they should not be in India and we'll talk about it after this video. <laughs> shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out Technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app. 
and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. So think of a view if we had a similar story. So think of a view if we had a similar store in India. How easy or difficult would it be for Amazon to retain the inventory? You know, and at times I have always believed that perhaps Amazon should have used India as the base country to develop this use case. Because as Indians, uh, we actually know to bypass every rule and every you know, um, you know, uh, law of the land. So it would it would have been interesting how Amazon would have actually tricked and you know understood how best can they retain the inventory and charging uh, the customers for the best possible items that they may have picked from the basket at the Amazon Go store. This one's an interesting one of Google AI, where they've actually, this is more about conversational artificial intelligence, where they have designed a bot uh, to interact um, with the caller and look at the fantastic response that this tool uh, offers. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um... Phone call. We think AI can help with this problem. Let's say you want to ask Google to make a ground for you, a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Think of this technology actually filling in for you for a Viva voice, uh, you know, ahead of your exams. It would be simply amazing where you simply ask Google Assistant to learn the subject for you, for which you're preparing, and there you go, interacts. So these are some of the use cases and the power that artificial intelligence holds, uh, be it conversation AI, be it, uh, you know, neural networks, be it machine learning. And if you look at one of the real uh, world use cases, which apparently is much closer to each one of us, is the way Netflix consumes big data. And the way Netflix does is it actually aggregates the data, which is uh, the ratings that the users input on the system. The search uh, that you do on Netflix, it actually stores that as well. Uh, your watch history, the nature of the show that you're watching, what is the, um, particular type of uh, or genre of that uh, particular show, the device on which you're accessing Netflix, whether it's your smartphone, your laptop, or your TV, um, the rewatch program history, how does, and the credit calculation and the program pause time. Netflix gathers all these inputs, all these data sets, and basis that prepares a set of fairly intuitively designed recommendations. And each time you log in, it very well states on the Netflix page, here's what you would recommend, basis your watch history. We've all heard about self-driven cars. Let's understand the science behind self-driven cars and how artificial intelligence is enabling um, these automobile setups. Back in 2009, in our early days at Google, we started working on self-driving cars. Today, we're called Waymo and our fully self-driving cars are on the road. They use a range of technology we've built from the ground up to understand the world around them and get you where you need to go. You're about to see how it all works and what it feels like to ride in our car. As it drives, Waymo uses LiDAR, which sends out millions of laser beams per second to build up a detailed picture of the world all 360 degrees around it. 
It also uses radar to detect how far away objects are and their speed. And high-resolution cameras detect visual information, like whether a traffic signal is red or green. It then combines all that data to understand the world around it. For example, in this fraction of a second, it knows exactly where it is on the road. It can also identify everything around it in full 360 degrees, and then predict what those things might do next. And it doesn't just do that for the objects you and I can see. It can do that for things up to three football fields away. What makes everything you can see right now possible is experience. Waymo has already self-driven millions of miles on complicated city streets, and it's constantly learning from every single mile it drives. With all that cyclist enough room to cycle past us, and also looking out for that pedestrian on the sidewalk. And when it comes to making decisions, this is a good example of how Waymo doesn't just take into account your safety, it also makes sure that both you and the people around you feel secure and at ease. Do you ever do you ever knew about it? I always wondered uh, how can a simple uh, automobile like a car can become so complex and so intelligent that it can make millions and billions of decisions in a fraction of a second while ensure not just ensuring the safety of the rider but also ensuring safety of the people around or the devices around or in, you know, guy, you know uh, other uh, you know, automobiles around as well. Here's perhaps another one, uh, which is more around the banking. So if, if the banks were to offer a personalized experience and if the banks actually have, or they, apparently they already have access to a lot of data. And before I played this video, um, let me share an interesting view. And this is about the, amount of data which any banking institution today aggregates about its customers versus what we may also not be knowing or what our family members may also not be knowing about you know ourselves each one of us receive a bank account statement be it a credit card or you know our savings account statement however majority of instances we look at the right side of the statement which actually has the amount the monetary value there's not every day where we look at the left hand side of the statement, which actually provides a lot of detail around where have we spent that money. So if you think about it for a moment, your bank knows where did you eat the pizza last month because you made the payment at you know other pizza joint using the bank's debit or credit card. The bank also knows where you went to watch for a movie. Bank also knows where did you get your car or you know, two wheeler service from. The bank also knows where which hotel did you stay and it also knows which supermarket did you buy your grocery from because each bit of this information is aggregated the moment you swipe your card now think of a situation where if a bank knows all of this and if it's some total amount of data that it has for you it will be much easier for the bank to actually come back to you and provide a recommendation that you know what anish we understand that you will be shopping at a superstore near your home here's a 10 percent cash back if you go next or, you know, Anish, we know that you are, you know, a, a specific uh, movie theater is your favorite because you've always been there to watch a movie. And here's, here's another offer for you. So let's look at an example if the bank was able to aggregate, read through the social media profile uh, of a particular customer and generate an instant recommendation and an offer uh, to a customer and even upsell its products. Let's have a look at this video. Can you imagine the intelligent banking experience on a vacation? while media account instantly banks intelligent soft analyzes his post on social media his sentiment his conversations about the product and after analyzing his spending pattern the bank offers a pre-approved bike loan along with information on the best dealers around their discounts offered and the color options available all on the go while ted is still on vacation banks geotagging technology identifies ted's location instantly analyzes his credit card spending pattern and offers him the best deals on bike accessories at a nearby store and this is not all before the vacation ends the bank delights ted by offering him free airline miles and complimentary hotel stay to plan his next vacation 
Imagine millions of customers like Ted for a bank like yours. The intelligent software enables you to continuously track millions of social media conversations to engage, interact, and offer a futuristic banking experience to your valuable customers. Place, time, or medium no longer matters. Engage your customers. Delight your customers. NewGen products help you do just that by connecting systems, processes, people, and things of your business. That's another example how, how the financial institutions can aggregate data, use artificial intelligence and machine learning, and provide more customized and personalized offers to the customers. There's also a myth where uh, it's been stated that artificial intelligence uh, you know, will, create, will not create jobs, will kill jobs, because everything will get automated, the manpower will not be required and stuff. Well, the fact is that's not the case. Artificial intelligence is not going to uh, reduce the number of jobs. And let me give you a very simple example around it. For a point in time towards early 1980s, when the ATM automated teller machines were installed by the companies uh, in the US, there was a lot of uh, undercurrent in the banking staff because what they felt that if, the, if an ATM machine is deployed at a bank, the role of a cashier or a cash teller will actually be redundant, which actually meant thousands and thousands of employees of individuals will get unemployed. But if you look at where we are today, after so many years, even today, while every bank has an ATM machine, but at every branch, you will still find a cashier or a cash teller uh, as well. And that's, that's a brilliant example of how machines and humans have coexisted because you would definitely need a human intervention at a specific point in time, for sure. AI is going to create jobs. The only difference is the nature of jobs will be different. It will, it will not be the same. So as an example, the jobs will mature from a data entry operator to a data analyst. The jobs will mature uh, from a market researcher to a market analyst. And that's how it will evolve. And within and that, and this is where we have seen the nature of jobs within the overall data and analytics ecosystem has evolved drastically. As an example, what we only understood as a data analyst a few years ago, today across data and analytics, we have multiple role profiles, be it a data engineer, be it a data visualization expert, be it a data scientist, be it a decision scientist, or whatnot. Hence, the AI or data analytics jobs will be different versus core jobs, but the demand will definitely increase in future. And this brings me to an end and perhaps the last video for the day with some totals, the overall concept of AI uh, very beautifully. Thanks to Microsoft uh, for this video. Here we go. Every day, a large portion of intelligence you know, HAL 9000 and Marvin the Paranoid Android. Thanks to books and movies, each generation has a weekday dinner. But if the age of AI is here, why don't our lives look more like the Jetsons? Well, for starters, that's a cartoon. And artificial intelligence more than you realize. And that's kind of the point. AI is designed so you don't realize there's a computer calling the shots. But that also makes understanding what AI is and what it's not a little complicated. In basic terms, complicated. In basic terms, AI is a broad area of computer science that makes machines seem like they have human intelligence. So it's not only programming a computer to drive a car by obeying traffic signals, but it's when that program also learns to exhibit signs of human-like road rage. As intimidating as it may seem, this technology isn't new. Actually, for the past half a century, it's been an idea ahead of its time. The term artificial intelligence was first coined back in 1956 by Dartmouth professor John McCarthy. He called together a group of computer scientists and mathematicians to see if machines could learn like a young child does, using trial and error to develop formal reasoning. The project proposal says they'll figure out how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans, and improve themselves. That was more than 60 years ago. 
Since then, AI has remained for the most part in university classrooms and super secret labs, but that's changing. Like all exponential curves, it's hard to tell when a line that's slowly ticking upwards is going to skyrocket. But during the past few years, a couple of huge amounts of data are being created every minute. In fact, 90% of the world's data has been generated in the past two years. And now thanks to advances in processing speeds, computers can actually make sense of all this information more quickly. Because of this, tech giants and venture capitalists have bought into AI and are infusing the market with cash and new applications. Very soon, AI will become a little less artificial and a lot more intelligent. Now the question is, should you brace yourself for yet another Terminator movie live on your city streets? Not exactly. In fact, stop thinking of robots. When it comes to AI, a robot is nothing more than the shell concealing what's actually used to power the technology. First, you have your bots. They're text-based and incredibly powerful, but they have limitations. But ask that same bot what time it is in Tokyo makes these bots a bit more sophisticated. When you ask Siri or Cortana where the closest, feeding it to a search engine and reading the answer back in human syntax. So in other words, you don't have to speak in code. At the far end of the spectrum is machine learning. And honestly, it's one of the most exciting areas of AI. Like a human, a machine retains information and becomes smarter over time. But unlike a human, it's not susceptible to things like short-term memory loss, information overload, sleep deprivation, and distractions. But how do these machines actually learn? Well, while it may be easy for a human to know the difference between a cat and a dog, for a computer, not so much. You see, when you're only considering physical appearance, the difference between cats and dogs can be a little gray. You can say cats have pointed ears and dogs have floppy ears, but those rules aren't universal. But computers spot the difference. But remember, machine learning is about making machines learn like humans. And like any toddler, that means they have to learn by experience. With thousands of examples to build an algorithm, it then tweaks the algorithm based on if it achieves its goal. Over time, the program actually gets smarter. Musical symphonies, or crush Ken Jennings at Jeopardy. Some programs even mimic the way the human brain is structured, complete with neural networks that help humans, and now machines, solve problems. Generations have long imagined the ramifications of AI, visualizing a society where machines seek revenge and wreak havoc on human society. However, the more logical and pressing question is, how will AI affect your job? Will it make your work obsolete? Just like the Industrial Revolution, it's not human versus machine, it's human and machine versus problem. The point is that artificial intelligence helps you accomplish more in less time, taking on the repetitive tasks of your job while you master the strategy and relationships. That way, humans can do what they do best, be human. <laughs>
uh, the pharmaceutical uh, sector as well, where AI is apparently enhancing uh, the overall speed uh, uh, to of trial and the accuracy of drug trials. And, and this is what we've really seen in the COVID era, where normally a drug trial would take at least five to six years. We've actually seen successful trials of drugs which are now being made to you uh, made for uh, the public uh, in a very short span of time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anish. Uh, um, we have a question from Pranav. Uh, he asks us, uh, which is the best and efficient data management tool uh, for big data, I guess? Well, it depends on on the use case and it depends on the enterprise as well. Um, so I think there, there is no specific tool which is specifically around data management because the way we understand data is there are several phases in which um, data is aggregated. So right from the very beginning, if you look at the data warehousing part of the data management, uh, there, there are several cloud-based uh, solutions which are available and on-premise uh, solutions available as well. So for on-premise, there are, there are Teradatas and Hadoops of the world. And for cloud, we've got AWS, uh, GCP, which is Google Cloud Platform, uh, Microsoft Azure uh, as well, which is available. Now that's from a data warehousing standpoint. Then comes the next phase, which is transforming the data. Now for data transformation, there are several other tools, Snowflake being one of them, which is a cloud-based tool. SaaS is another tool, which is on-premise. So it depends on what specific life cycle or stage of data management you're looking at uh, from a tooling perspective. And then there's a third element, which is the ETL, which is extracting, transform transforming and loading uh, you know, step, which actually uh, requires a different set of tools. Right. On a similar note, I would like to ask, uh, what is uh, the general life cycle like? How do you identify a problem that you can solve with data? And then how do you go about solving it? Uh, that's an interesting question. So in summary, the, the problem, the way problem is uh, understood is by reviewing and studying and analyzing the data. Now, that could be uh, either hundreds uh, of rows of data or thousands or, you know, uh, lakhs of rows of data. So what is essentially looked at is an outlier. Uh, versus a common trend. So as an example, if you were to look at the economic growth of India as a country, uh, and if we have data for the last 10 years, uh, it, it will be very easy for us to identify outliers for the last two years because of the COVID situation. But then we may also be witness a significant, uh, a, a, some, a, some uh, uh, you know, a set of debt uh, in some point in a you know, few years as well. So I think the first and foremost is analyzing the data. That's one. The second uh, um, aspect that's done is uh, cleansing the data. The third is deduplication. And of course, once we have the final data set is where we identify and try to find the remediation or you know, mitigating factors around solving or resolving the problem. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one question from uh, Hemendra. He's asking, uh, how do you handle bias uh, that is actually caused by machine learning algorithms? Brilliant question. Now there are there are various there are various ways in which we can apparently manage a bias um, in a machine learning algorithm, and and there could be several types of bias as well. And one of the biases could be because of a because of a system error, where the system is not able to read a specific data set. That's one. The second bias could be the way we are training our data set. Now, as an example, let's say, and I'll give you a very simple example, uh, and this is. A real example, I would not name check the organization, but there, there was a big enterprise, big tech giant, which designed a machine learning based system to select the candidates for a specific role. And they trained their systems to an extent that uh, it would scan the resume and will come up uh, with an outcome that, okay, this, this individual is fit for the job versus X individual. When the system went live, uh, the recruiters at that, or that organization actually saw a trend and the trend was the system was apparently shortlisting more male candidates versus female candidates. And this was obviously because of an element of bias where the training data set actually meant that certain kinds of jobs can only be was, were major, were majorly been done by men versus women. That's, that's another way to look at it. Now, if you were to design an algorithm to review the resume, at times, it could also be a possibility where, let's say, in a resume, there is a section called called hobbies, and in that hobby, 
an individual mentions uh, hobby as cricket and 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 second applicant mentions hobby as badminton an obvious bias that may come to our mind is and if we don't know the gender of the applicant where the hobby is mentioned as badminton should be a should be a female versus where the hobby is mentioned as cricket should be a male and that's an all that's an unintended and obvious bias that comes in the mind so we need to look at um, such outliers that's that's the third one and the last one is we need to ensure uh, whatever is the output of the training data set as a pilot we need to look at ensuring that there are no specific outliers or no specific outcome which are oriented towards a certain set of results which may probably emerge as a theme yep but those were again problems that uh, even humans have biases and uh, those anyway existed but uh, it is nice that we are able to identify those in algorithms and find ways around it uh, i think another question that we have uh, is about uh, personal data getting uh, misused by social media companies and your thoughts on the same i blame i i would blame um, I wouldn't blame social media companies to a large extent. Rather, I would say that the power is in our hands to ensure how best are we able to manage what what is the information that we want to offer uh, the tech giants to actually retrieve. Uh, and a very simple example is all of us, the majority of us use Google a Gmail account. Now think of a point that within, and, and I would I really encourage you to do this today, is go to the security tab uh, or privacy tab on your Google account settings, and you will see the level of information that Google intends to aggregate unless you have deselected or switched off those options. So first, Google has access to your Gmail, and that means it's reading through your emails. And within, within the overall privacy tab, there is another information which is accessing emails from an advertising perspective, then you should switch it off. If you're using Google Maps, uh, there is a Google location history, you know, that you should actually switch off because Google, if, if again, you should switch off if you not, if you don't want Google to uh, track your location and you know store that information. However, if you're okay with that, keep it on. I, I don't. So that's third, that second. The web history, as an example, whatever you search um, on Google, it actually aggregates that search history as well. So it, it's in your hands to, to switch it off. Similar is the case with Apple uh, as well. If you look at the iPhone, there are certain features in privacy tab, which actually you can switch off to ensure you're, you're not being tracked. There, is, there are significant aspects around the location, the, the geolocation, the sensor, the altitude, uh, which apps are you giving access to uh, from, from a microphone perspective, uh, contacts, uh, camera. I think a, a majority of this is in our hands in terms of how aware are we with regards to what information do we want to give access to these apps. That's fun. The second, uh, let's understand and let's accept the fact that uh, no service comes for free. So Facebook, as an example, or any, or whether it's Google as well, they while we receive Gmail as a service free of cost, there definitely has to be a revenue model which sits behind it where they can monetize the data. And you apparently have consented uh, Google and every tech giant to monetize the data because you've accepted their terms of use. How many of us apparently have gone through the terms and conditions which actually are available when we sign up for the account? It's a long statement, very verbose. Because we are in a hurry to create an account, we say accepted, accept. I happen to read the privacy statement of Google and uh, Apple, and apparently there's a stark difference between the privacy statements of these two companies. In terms of transparency, Apple is far more transparent and uh, far more particular about aggregating information about a user versus uh, Google. And these are some of the things that we should be really aware of. And if we are, then there will definitely be very minimal instances of a data loss. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there is another question about uh, explainability of uh, ML algorithms in banking. And uh, how 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 do you explain it to people in business, or how do you justify the system? So explainability explainability with regards to machine learning um, has been the talk of the town because it has it very closely resonates with the privacy uh, and the impact and an unintended outcome when it comes to banking. And then 
as an outcome of this, there are uh, various models which have been developed, code of ethics which have been developed to an extent that from a machine learning algorithm standpoint, there is a governance board that actually is now uh, being set up in majority of the uh, banking giants, which actually makes or identifies a senior executive as accountable in an event, anything goes wrong in an event, the particular model or a data science model yields a negative or yields an unintended outcome. That's why all the models have been tested and tried to ensure uh, the risk of false uh, in outcomes are fairly next to zero. Right. Uh, there's also another question uh, about implementation of a Theranos-like system. Uh, I'm not aware of this, but yeah. Sorry, I'm not aware of this as well. Uh, so moving on to the next question, uh, uh, Virar asks us about uh, what if the program can rewrite its own code and then diverges from the intentions of its creator? Is that possible? Is the code rewritten by the program? Well, that's not not, not possible um, unless uh, you've actually designed the program which triggers a mechanism for a code to be rewritten uh, for a specific outcome. But unless it's manually triggered, so we we do have code conversion utilities right now, and this is this is really handy because with the transformation of existing tools and platforms, as an example, an enterprise wants to move away from SaaS as a platform to Snowflake as a platform. Um, there are certain code conversion utilities where you feed in your code and it converts the code from the SaaS environment to a Snowflake environment. Yes, that exists, but the, the outcome uh, of the code doesn't change. That's one. And even if that's the case, once the code conversion utility transforms or tra changes the code, there is a test environment that's 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 in, uh, that's that's been put that's put in place, which actually tests uh, the outcome of the revised code. And in event that the out output is not as per the requirement, that code is, is not promoted to the production environment. So there are checks and balances in place as well. Uh, so follow up on those, uh, the checks and balances are not only on the accuracy and prediction, right? So uh, you also have to check for biases like we discussed uh, some time ago. Are there any other checks that you guys do before deploying a model? So uh, yes, biases is one. Uh, the output is second. Uh, the third, uh, I think of anything else. So to be honest, uh, primarily we we do check on the output. Uh, that that's about it. So essentially, the model output has to be in line with the intended consequence, not the unintended. And this is where broadly the checks fall. Should be. Right. Uh, so one more question that uh, I have from my side is, uh, what does one do uh, to become a, a valuable professional in data science and to stay relevant? Because it seems like the field moves too fast. I'll correct your, uh, your question. So valuable professional or a professional is equally uh, you know, good, I would say. But uh, there are two aspects to look at it. One is for an individual who wants to start a career in data and analytics versus an individual who already is into data and analytics and wants to actually you know learn and uh, move forward so for for the individuals who do not have a background around data analytics i think my, my first uh, view would be that don't be nervous uh, with the fact that analytics requires coding well coding is not difficult that's fine the second is you need to find the right intervention which you would probably want to go through and that intervention could be uh, a good college or a university which is offering hands and experience you know by uh, which actually embeds uh, capstone projects as part of their curriculum that's second and the third uh, is uh, perhaps uh, similar to what i would also account uh, for uh, for the individuals who are already in data analytics and that is more around uh, continue to read uh, subscribe to various newsletters um, and uh, yeah, uh, stay close to the subject. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anish. Uh, so, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, so, Uh, uh, 
Okay, so the voice is breaking, but I get your message. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for this session. Um, and uh, yep, if, if there are any further follow up questions, feel free to direct them over to me via email. Uh, but thank you very much for this opportunity. It was lovely to interact with the students and uh, stay safe and best wishes. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, sir.